Unreal 5.5 has brought a lot of new features to Sequencer. Last time we looked at dynamic binding, this time we're going to look at conditions. One of the limitations of Sequencer is that by default all of the tracks will play as they have been added. You can explicitly disable them, but if you want to disable them based on criteria while the game is playing, that is where conditions come in handy. So in this particular sequencer that we've created, we sort of create this movement and a Niagara effect, but we only want to have that animation play if there is a rock in front of us, so not when there isn't. Using conditions, we can decide when that animation plays and when it doesn't. So if we go back to the sequencer that we're, we're using here, we can see that we've got an animation on the character mesh, the third person character, and that will always play regardless. However, the rock itself is a dynamically bound actor. So if we go to our blueprint, what we're doing is we're doing a line trace in the level director to find a rock, and then we are possessing that rock. And our level sequence has just been triggered by pressing the one key in the player character. So if we want this animation only to play, if the condition is true that there is a rock in front of us, i.e. the line trace is possessing a rock, then what we can do is use conditions. So in Unreal 5.5, there are certain tracks where you can add conditions. For instance, a transform track. So if you right click, and you can either go to the Edit Track section or to the Edit section. And on both of these, you will get a condition option. When you click on that, you can either have no condition, so the track will always play. You can create a specific condition blueprint. You can also group conditions, so you could have multiple conditions with logical and ors. You could have a platform condition, so it only plays if it matches a particular platform. You could have a scalability condition, so it constrains it only to certain sort of scalability settings. You can also add via the director blueprint a new condition endpoint, or you can quick bind using the condition library that's built in, and this will create a function in the director blueprint and provide you with this information. So if in our case we want to add it to the animation, so this is our animation and this is this cast animation, we can right click on the animation itself. We can go to the edit track or edit section. If you use the edit track, then everything on that track will be subject to the condition. If you do the edit section, then it will just be that section. So if I put this on the section, I go to the condition here, and I say, create a new condition endpoint, and I click on that. It will automatically open the director blueprint with this condition that's being created. You can name the condition. So you could say player animation, evaluate condition. You can add inputs to the condition, and you can send data through via the event itself. In our particular case, we only want to play this animation if the rock object, which we are binding to dynamically on a line trace, is valid. So we could just take the rock object, we can say, just do an is valid check on that and that will return the value so if it is valid we want to play the animation if it isn't we don't we also get this condition context that you can see here so you can break that just to have a look and this will give you access to the world context so using that you can find out data about the world so you could search for characters and look for data on them to decide whether to return a true or false value. You get the bindings, 
And as multiple objects can be bound to the same condition, you can get an array of those objects. But this is a simple condition that we are setting here. And when we go back to our level sequence, we now see that we get this icon on that section track, this tick cross, which means that there is a condition deciding whether this track plays or not. When you click on that again, so if you go to the edit track, there will be no condition, but on the edit section, we've added it. You now get some more sort of options to set. So you can decide whether it's called in the editor, whether to pass that condition context that we saw in the event. You can add a scope to it so it can be global. So it will have the same, reg same result regardless of what it is bound to. You can have different conditions or different bindings or conditions for different owner objects. You also have a check frequency. So this determines whether the condition is checked only once when the evaluation takes place or whether it is checked on tick. And you can, t and with the on tick, it allows it to keep checking for the condition because it could change as the sequence progresses. And we'll come back to this in a moment. You can obviously have an invert condition, whether it's active or not. But first of all, we should check to see whether it just doesn't play the animation or does play the animation. And we'll see what the first issue is. So when we're not looking, it doesn't play it. So that's correct. So each time I press one, we get this print hello in the left. And if I press it here, again, it plays it on the rock. So it's possessing it, but we're not getting the animation on the player. And that's kind of a logical reason. So if I open this again, as I said, we are checking the frequency only once. So that means at the start, it's checking it. It's also checking to see whether the it's also binding this object here using the binding properties because we're using a dynamic binding, which we did in a previous tutorial at the same time. So the sequence in which this happens may determine whether or not the object exists. So this is a, an example of where it is better to put it as check frequency on tick. So it will keep checking to see whether that object is being bound or not. So now once we've changed it and we play, it should play the full sequence when we're looking at the rock. If we look away, nothing will play because we're not possessing a rock. And if we look at another rock again, the full sequence will play. So the condition is being correctly evaluated. And those conditions can be as complex as you like. So they could be based on, you could check the character's stamina, character's health, and so forth in here by getting access to the third person character to decide whether or not it can play that animation or not. You can also use conditions to add variations to your sequences. For instance, on this rock, we've just got a transform that moves it, moves it higher when we play it. So this rock will essentially just move up in the air. We might want to add a condition where sometimes it not only moves up in the air, but it may, may spin, do a 360 as well as moving up in the air. And other times it just moves up in the air. So we could add another track with a condition. So this is one track, which is an additive track. We can right click on here. We could add another additive track for a, and call this our sort of rotation track, rotation transform. We just want the rotation so we can remove the location. We can remove the scale. And maybe we just want to play about with the with the yaw. So we could start off with a yaw at zero. And then maybe towards the end, we can make it go up to 
So that would then do this, but we don't want the rotation to play every time. We want that to be more random. So how do we add a condition track that always plays this transform, which moves it up, but the rotation transform is based on a condition. Now, you could click on the transform here and say edit track and add a condition. However, that condition would then apply to all of the transforms on that track. If you just wanted to be on this rotation transform, you should do that as an edit section. So on here on the condition, we can say create new condition endpoint. We can maybe just rename that as rotate evaluate condition. And we could maybe just return this as a, a random event. So a random bool. So it'll be true or false, maybe 50% of the time. We can save that. We don't need to change anything else on this. So leave the scope the same. We just want to check the frequency once. And that should be enough. So if we close that, so if I go back to the level and play it, so there it's lifted it and rotated it. On this one, it is just lifting it. And on this one, again, it is just lifting it. But as you can see, it will sort of randomly do one or the, or do both. So this one is doing both. This one again is doing both. Look at this rock again. It does both that time. Again, it does both. But this time it just lifts it without doing the rotation. So we're getting some random variation being added. You can also use conditions to play random animations. For instance, on this level sequence, it will play a different clap animation in a random fashion, depending on a random integer that has been generated each time. So again, it will play one of three different animations there. And the way that that works is rather simple. So again, we've got the player character, which is a replaceable dynamic actor binding. And then on the character mesh, I've added three different animations, three different claps. Now without conditions, it would only play the top one. But the way that I've added a condition is on each of the section tracks, I've created a play animation evaluate condition, and that sends an animation index from zero, one, two. So if I go have a look at that, and it simply compares the animation index of that animation we're sending through to a random index that has been calculated at the start of the sequencer. And that is the return value. And the way that that is calculated is by combining this with creating an event. So I've added an event track as a trigger. I've specified in its properties, it's to be evaluated at the start of evaluation. And then that event track, which is added here, is bound to this function in the director blueprint, where it just creates a random integer between zero to two, because I've got three different animations, and it sets it as the animation index, which is then this number that we compare. And each animation will have in its a different animation index. So the first one is zero, the second one is one, and the third one will be two. And the check frequency is just one. I've had to bring these forward by one frame. That just seems to be a little bit of an issue otherwise. But then it will just randomly, at the start of the evaluation, when I press one, it will play a different animation for the clap in a random manner. 
So again, that allows you to play, add variation without having to create different animation sequences for this. And as I said, the conditions can basically be as complex or as simple as you want them to be because you are using the director blueprint to determine the return value. And you do have access to the world context on this condition context. So I hope that is a quick overview of how conditions can be used in Sequencer 5.5.